have you here at Hope Center. Why don't you just take two seconds, high five someone, tell them, hey, he is risen. We serve and live in Jesus. Welcome to church. If you're in the building, why don't you come on in to the auditorium? We got a fantastic day in God lined up today. We're super expectant for what he wants to do. Trust you've had a great weekend. And uh, we're looking forward to an amazing, amazing day today in God. That's right. Resurrection Sunday is the Sunday that started it all. Amen. There was a, the proof of the pudding that Jesus rose and conquered the grave. He conquered sin. He conquered death. And the Bible says this. Jesus said this. He said, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world and all that is in it. And good cheer means to have hope. Good cheer means to not be discouraged. And good cheer means joy, excessive joy. Has anyone got any excessive joy in the house? Amen. So Father God, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for your re the resurrection power. And Father, we just release a fresh joy. We have a fresh hope in you. We have a fresh delight in you. We are not discouraged. We are encouraged. And we just worship you today. Why don't you come out of your seat if you need to? And the whole altar call is here for you to encounter our resurrection Savior. Come on, let's worship the King. Glory in the high. 
sing in this song, when I think about the measure of His redeeming love, what is that measure? That measure was that He gave everything. He gave us His life. Ha. Huh. So what measure will we give Him this morning of our worship and our praise? Will you increase that measure? Will you increase what you feel safe doing this morning? Will you increase? And will you step out and give Him more this morning? He's so worthy. He's so worthy, so worthy. You're 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 so worthy, so worthy. I give you all. So worthy, so worthy. You're so worthy, so worthy. You're so worthy, so worthy. Jesus, you're so worthy, so worthy. You're so worthy, so worthy. I praise you, I praise you. So worthy, so worthy. You're so worthy, so worthy. Yes, you are. You're so worthy, so worthy. You're so worthy, so worthy.
<laughs> oh, I think we need to praise a bit more, hey? Yeah. Praise Him, praise Him, praise Him. Shout it out, glory in the highest. The sun was darkened and the heavens thundered And for a moment death had thought it had conquered But it wasn't over till you said it's over Your word is greater still The perfect sacrifice your body Broken as you restore to us what sin had stolen. Once and for all, you tore the veil wide open. Your power is stronger still. Oh, praise, oh, praise to the name. Your name 
Jesus, 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 you defeated the grave. 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 You're victorious. You're magnificent. to God you know the angels declared to the women why do you look for the living among the dead he's not here he is risen and Ephesians 1 tells us that that power is the same as the mighty strength that he exerted in Christ Jesus when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms 
far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And God has, God has raised him up and has placed all things under his feet for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. And one just across this place, why don't you lift your hands as we as we declare that significant truth? That he's not dead, he's alive, he's been raised. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, above every title, above the name of every God, above the name of every principality or power or nation or or politician. It's the name of Jesus is above every name. And oh, we give you praise and worship and we glorify you because yours is the name. Yours is the name above every name. The cross still stands, the blood still flows, the work is finished, and hell still knows that the grave is still empty, the stone is still rolled, you're still high and lifted up, you're still seated on the throne, the cross still stands, the blood still the work is finished, and hell still knows that the grave is still empty, the stone is still rolled. You're still high and lifted up, you're still seated on the throne. Your name is healing. Your name. 
Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. over every enemy Jesus for my family I speak the holy name Jesus shout Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets Jesus in the darkness over every enemy out to him presence of God is falling in this place oh oh we lift you up Jesus we lift you up Jesus thank you for moving 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 in this room right now in Jesus name he is here oh oh don't don't look left or right don't look to any other distraction turn your gaze and your attention and your focus on Jesus. 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 As we're here in the presence of our Lord this morning, as we're here in His presence, we're going to come around a time of communion to stay in the presence of God, stay focused on Him. John chapter 20. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one that Jesus loved, and said, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Mary Magdalene, she on the first day of the week, she walked towards the tomb with a heavy heart and then she saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb and, and something within her heart began to ignite about, well, well, what's happening? Possibilities, perhaps. She stepped into the tomb and looked around and she couldn't find Jesus because he was no longer there. And so she ran to, to find the other disciples and, and Simon, Peter and John, they, they heard what she was saying. They couldn't quite understand it, but they ran to the tomb and they looked and Mary looked, she couldn't find Jesus. Simon Peter, he ran into the tomb and he looked around at the grave clothes and Jesus wasn't there. He disappeared. John stepped into the tomb and he looked and Jesus wasn't there. Well, I'm pleased to announce this morning, church, that we've found Jesus. <laughs> Jesus is here. Come on, let's give him some praise. Jesus descended into heaven and then he fell in fire. He fell in fire and he is here right now. The flames, the flames of the Spirit of God 
ablaze and we have found Jesus and he is right here amongst us. Jesus, we give you praise. We give you glory. You are the Lord. Come on, let's give him praise this morning. Jesus Christ has been discovered. He's been found and he is right here amongst us this morning. We give you praise. We give you praise. And so as we come this morning remembering what Jesus has done, He left and then He descended in fire amongst us. So as I pray, why don't you come, receive the bread, receive the drink, and remember that Jesus, (laughs) He left the tomb. He did what He is called to do. He left and then He's here amongst us. Lord Jesus, we worship You for giving of Yourself for entering heaven. So please come forward, receive communion right now. Shura <laughs> And we recognize this morning that you are here in the room amongst us. Holy Spirit fire. Shura basunda. Burn through the room. Burn through the room in Jesus' name. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written jesus christ my living hope who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the god of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken i am forgiven The King of Kings calls me His own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Your buried body, it began. 
and the devil and you said in John 10:10, 10, 10, I've come that they may have life and have it more abundantly and we receive from your life this morning we receive from the life of God Jesus said the thief the destroyer comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy come on lift your hands before the Lord but he says but I have come that they may have life and father we just thank you that in your presence Addictions are being broken. We thank you sins are forgiven. We thank you in your presence, Lord, pain leaves. We thank you healing is broken. Uh, sickness is broken. Healing is released, Lord God. We thank you demonic bondage, oh God, has to come to an end because he's risen. And you've defeated principalities and powers. You've led them as prisoners in your victory possession. And so, Father, we just release your life. Your life. Upon every heart and every life here in this place, we declare life to you. To those that have torment in your minds, we release peace to you in the name of Jesus. We release peace to you in Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen. It's a real pleasure to invite uh, Pastor Reg Marias. Pastor Reg and his wife, they pioneered living faith community church uh, in Perth, Australia. And uh, that church has just had such tremendous impact in the nations. There's now 750 churches that have either been planted or are connected to his church. He's a, um, he's a, a man of amazing prophetic abilities, but also a teacher. They've got a Bible college um, called Anoint the World Bible College and also a online university. He's the author of 25 books. So this is what you call a busy person. And he's been a tremendous blessing and a man of real humility, but a man who walks with the Lord. And so why don't you jump on, on your feet and let's give a great big God bless you, a Hope Center welcome to Pastor Reg Marias as he comes to minister. Please have a seat. Thank you. Can we say a prayer right now? <clears throat> Father, we thank you for the
the book of John chapter 3 verse 16 says for God so loved this world he gave his one and only begotten son your son Jesus God came on that very day for us around about over 2,000 years ago he came 33 years he walked among us on the 33rd year of his life was crucified on the cross of Calvary and at the end of his life as he comes out three days later he rise, rises up from the tomb today we celebrate the resurrection Sunday God thank you for canceling our sins thank you for canceling our debts thank you for canceling everything the year of Jubilee has been given to us right now God all our debts has been canceled God today we live in freedom and we live in liberty we live in glory we live in hope Bible says to me the book of Romans chapter 5 verses 5 now there is hope hope is not there to disappoint you and God has now reestablished our connection with this Almighty God once upon a time we were living in the kingdom of darkness he's brought us into the kingdom of light through his son Jesus Christ right now we celebrate the victory for this day right now for who you are for what you are for what you're gonna do among us God we love you we are in love with you our butterflies are still in our tummy God just to fall in love all over again God we raise your anthem we raise your flag God the whole world will know in the whole nation of New Zealand will know God that Jesus Christ is well and truly alive Bible says to me in the book of Hebrews Jesus Christ is the same yesterday today and forever God we stand with you right now as we bow to you and as we convey God our love to you right now to all the things you've done we are forever indebted grateful to you God in every sense of the word God your love your love your love God for us give you thanks and praise God in Jesus name all God's people say amen, amen. thank you to those of you guys um, pa, Dr. Seth and I go a long way back uh, about six seven years ago before COVID started and uh, he came down into my city per, city of Perth and I've got we got a church called Living Faith Community Church and uh, that's the mothership the mothership has planted 790 churches around the globe so I got about 1800 pastors under my leadership and I think just to confirm that pastor Paul Saunders um, there is uh, uh, what we call Anoint the World Theological Seminary, which has been accredited, accreditation given by the Australian government. So we then do certificate ministry, diploma in ministry, and then advanced diploma in ministry, and then we do the graduate diploma in ministry. And on top of it, then I started about eight, nine years ago a university based in Tampa, Florida. All my lecturers are American lecturers. And so we, over there, we do the, mass, the, the bachelor's, the master's, the doctorate, and the PhDs. And so over the years, God has been very good to me. To those of you guys who do not know me, who I am, what I am, I had autism, Tourette syndrome, OCD, Asperger's, and nonverbal. So with this condition, with five conditions, I've tried myself to kill on many occasions. So on this particular morning, I am so excited the fact that Jesus came and died for me and set me free. Now I'm like a monkey swinging around wherever I want to, wherever I want to do that. So I'm, I'm really, really delighted to be here. Um, in my city, when you come down and if I were to do a conference by Sunday, there won't be, there will be people, but people will come and say, as Rich, we're not going to come out. I said, why? It's, we are conferenced out. But with you lot, you don't, I don't think so. You guys are conferenced out. I was just praying, I was just praying, maybe there will be just some people and I could pray and I can just escape to victory kind of thing. But there is no chance that it's going to happen with me. Um, well, this is my uh, wonderful family. Uh, my eldest son, Jesse, he's grown up to six feet tall. And this is a picture which was taken in 2019. It's getting old. I got to upgrade it. The young son, he's about 13 right now. That is my sweetest and sweetest heart of my, uh, of my life, and I call her my uh, hot shot. And um, I call her all the time and I've, that, that I've got hots for her still till this day, 20 years of marriage. 
It's, uh, don't take this as an offense. I want to break the ice. Uh, when you are married, you know, you can see that I'm the only dark person over here. <laughs> and so when you're multiculturally uh, married, you have got some, I'm a prankster. <clears throat> I like to crack a lot of jokes. So as a family, we'll go together and we will have the four seats in the middle of the, in the, middle of the plane. And I'll, and I'll get bored. After two, three hours later, I'll get bored. And then I will start to hit, you know, the flight attendant button. I'll hit the flight attendant button, and I will separate from my wife. And I'll say, ma'am, I've got some problems. This lady <laughs> does not know how to take care of her boys. <laughs> and I'm just wanting letting, I just want to let you know that, you know, could you please put myself somewhere else? <laughs> and... Uh, and uh, she has got no control. I don't know where the father is. The father is missing. <laughs> and my wife, uh, she will give me this staring look. She's got blue eyes. And so the, you know, the steely blue eyes, like a laser beam, will hit on me. And then I have a lot of jokes with my wife, with my boys. And every time we go around to any of the airports, I'll do things like this. And you know, it's, it's wonderful to be married to my wife. Um, just want to break the ice with you guys. Um, what else I got to say? A couple of quick things if I can go through with you guys. I just want to thank a number of people if it is okay with you. I've written some things over here. First and foremost, I want to thank Dr. Seth and Debbie Fawcett. Can we please put a big round of applause? Uh, uh, uh. And second of all, I've known uh, Pastor Paul Saunders at least for the last number of years. Can we please put a big round of applause for him and his wonderful wife? Thank you kindly. And then, I, and then this morning, once again, I met uh, uh, Hannah and Beth, Beth in particular. Beth is extremely efficient, and she just keeps on saying this. She reminds me of my wife, and she will always get me you know, in, in order. Can we please put a big round of applause for Hannah and Beth? Thank you. Then this morning, obviously, I met a wonderful couple, Patrick and Sue Lim, and this wonderful man in the last few days, a few days has been assisting me, peace as well. Can I ask of you guys to please put a big round of applause? Thank you. <clears throat> if you've got your Bible with you, <clears throat> I have promised you, last night I promised that I want to pray for every single person. And so this morning, as soon as I finish my message, I would love to pray all of you guys. This will be my last day. I've got a big revelation, and I want to share the revelation. Tomorrow, I'm out of here, baby. I'm gone. <laughs> I am missing my wife, and I'm missing my boys, and I'm going to get back home. I'm about to start a brand new topic. <clears throat> Apart from my university and my theological seminary, I run it a school called the School of Impartation. In that School of Impartation, I train men and women, thousands of, peop thousands of guys, to be trained in the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. But this particular time, I'm going to be teaching to my, uh, to my hundreds of students who, are, who I'm going to impart to them, what is the meaning of earnest prayer? What is the meaning of fervent prayer? How do we, can we enter into the realm of fervent prayer? Last night, once again, God had a funny sense of humor with Pastor Paul San Saunders. He came up and he was starting to laugh because he was drunk in the Holy Spirit. And he was meant to take offerings, but the offerings was not going anywhere because he was so intoxicated by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then while he's trying to hold his entire being, he starts to mention about this scripture, the book of James, chapter 5, verses 17. So the message was prepared yesterday afternoon at about 3 o'clock, and this man brings this, this, this scripture as a place of, you know, love offering to be raised up. So Bible says to me, the book of James chapter 5, verses 17, Elijah was a man of our nature. And Bible says to me, some translation it says that Elijah prayed earnestly prayer for the rain to come. It's amazing, though. The book of 1 Kings chapter 17 verses 1 scripture also says to me that God, all of you guys will agree with me, God is sovereign. 
If God is sovereign, He does not need you. He could do things, you know, He can do things on His own. But in the midst of all this, God the Almighty says to young, Eli, young Elijah, I want you to shut the heavens down. It's as though that, you know, it's as though that you know, the scripture clearly says that God is in partnership with every man, with every woman in this church and around the globe and around the world. At that very, and the scripture says in the book of 1 Kings chapter 17 verses 1, at that voice of Elijah, God shuts the heavens down. Three and a half years later, then God then starts to speak to Elijah back again. And he says, Elijah, I want you to open up the realm of heaven so that rain will come back again. Once again, it goes to show God is not doing automatically or sovereignly, but he's working in co-partnership and in sovereign move of the power of God in partnering with another human being. And so I feel that every single person in this church should be and ought to be really excited in the sense of what God is able to do, but he wants to do with us, partnering with us, and he doesn't, he wants to get all the glory. Bible, and I, and I, when, I, when Dr. Seth brought this theme, zeal for the conference, that means there's a, you know, the God of divine jealousy on us. As much as he's got the God of divine jealousy, he still wants to make sure, can I share that love? Can I share that power? Can I share that grace with my creation? And I find that extraordinary, a God who still wants to partner with us at this moment. Let me now take you a little bit of history. We know the city of Nineveh is about to come in un unto judgment. In the midst of the judgment, God could have spoken, but God decided to chose, choose Jonah. In the process of it, as Jonah goes through in his life, he was a reluctant prophet because he couldn't care less about Nineveh. In the midst of all this, he can get throw, he, now he throws himself out of the boat, out of the ship, goes into the whale, three days and three nights, and he comes out, out of it, and then he starts to speak the power of God. Nineveh, finally it says, Scripture says to me, the king and the entire subjects goes into full-time fasting and prayer, including the cattle and herd. Bible says they also went through fasting and prayer. God releases on a word by one man called Jonah. So we find in this exclusivity of James, chapter 5, verse 17, how God honors a man and a woman's words. And why is it the scripture says, the book of James says, that he earnestly prayed, yet another translation it says that, that he fervently prayed. What does the meaning earnest means? What does the meaning fervent means? And I want to impart this in your life. But before I go any further, sometimes, you know, some of us, when we come into up in the podium, we start to become very theologically based, which is a fantastic thing. But then I also want to bring you into the, the message to the relevant and the current day of how we are meant to get this earnestness. Many, many years ago, as a young man, <clears throat> God said to me, I want you to go and have a TV ministry to go over 140 nations. I said, okay. And there was a company called, sorry, there was an LLC company called Inspiration Network, started by Morris Serolo. Some of you guys know Morris Serolo. He's gone to be with the Lord. And I had a relationship with Morris Serolo's son. And eventually I said, could I do this? And he said, sure, you could do it. We will beam it out from North Carolina or South Carolina. In the midst of all this, you know, God, by the realm of faith, you know, we got the, you know, the most expensive cameras and all the above, but we did not know who could produce and how could, who could produce, who could direct and all the above. Somewhere along the line, a wonderful gentleman was introduced to me. But this man said to me, I will do all the above, but I want to say to you that I'm eighth, half atheist and half agnostic. Are you okay with that? For me, anyone who comes an atheist or agnostic, it's an opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. I said, yeah, sure, mate. 
you could come, you can help me out. And so you'll come on Sunday morning and Sunday night, and he will record all my teachings, and then he will edit it, and then he will, and then he will produce it, and then he will FedEx it straight to South Carolina. In the midst of all this, somewhere along the line, as a man who is atheist and agnostic, he starts to ask some interesting questions. Questions like, why do people fall when you pray? Why are they falling like flies? What is going on within your God and these people who are on, on the ground? And then, you know, and I started to answer him. As time went by, he says to me, as he, you know, as he edits it, and he says to me, your scripture to your sermon does not line up. I said, how do you know? I went and checked in the Bible. So I said to myself, am I the preacher or he is the preacher? So he's becoming so well-versed in my teaching and in my preaching, he's now correcting me how I was meant to preach and how every preaching in my sermon and the scriptures needs to line up. In the midst of all this, he's still not giving his heart to Jesus. The Bible says to me, the book of uh, five, uh, James chapter 5, verses 17, the Bible says to me, Elijah was a man of our nature. He prayed earnestly that, uh, for rain to come, rain produced. In the midst of all this, he has got a hobby farm somewhere in Beverly. It's about three hours outside, two hours outside of Perth. And in this hobby farm, it's about 10 acres. One afternoon, he had this radio playing out, and the radio says, towards your Beverly, there's a cyclone, which is considered in the American system as tornado, is coming through. And as he hears about this, and he starts to see in his backyard, he could see something about 10 houses away. All the clay tiles and concrete tiles are now swept off by this cyclone. It's happening right in front of him. Immediately when he sees this, he panics and he starts to get a, you know, a fear in him. He goes inside a big a barn, a big shed that is recently built. It. He locks himself up in that barn. And he was waiting for the cyclone to go, uh, to, uh, for the cyclone to leave. So, but somewhere along the line, he was pacing up and down, thinking what's going to happen to his kitchen, what's going to happen to his bathroom, what's going to happen to his entire roof tiles. In the midst of all this, some or rather, my Holy Spirit starts to work in his life. And the Holy Spirit says to me, well, you have been following this guy, this crazy coot called Rich Marais. Why don't you call the name Jesus? And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this confidence comes in. He opens up, listen very carefully to me. He opens up this barn door. He doesn't mention the name Jesus. He opens up, he could see another one more house away before his roof tiles are now going to be cut up by this cyclone. He stands in the middle of his 10-acre ten, ten paddock. He raises his hands up and he says, I call upon the God of Rich Marias. You will shut this cyclone away and you will move away and you will not come. Immediately, right in front of his eyes, the cyclone took off in another direction. And uh, Monday morning, he comes up to me. He says to me, all hail, Ridge. All hail, Ridge. I said, don't do that. I said, what happened? He said, you know what, mate? This stuff that you teach, it actually, actually works. I said, how does it work? And he starts to convey the entire incident which took place two days ago in his property. He says, this God is a powerful God. I came out, I did not mention the name Jesus, but I mentioned that how Jesus is associated with you, that I've seen a lot of things. I call the God of Rich Marais, Cyclone got turned off. Can I say this? Can I encourage you that sometimes a man or a woman will struggle to know God? Can I take you a little bit further in? You see, the, uh, the word gospel means it's good news. Good news travels fast. Unfortunately, today you and I live in a world, media runs your nation and media runs everything. And so I call the media have got false prophets. 
They run a narrative and they want to run in every, how should you be wearing? What sort of watch should, be ha should you be having? What sort of suit should you be having? And they will tell you over and over again how to run your own life. But in the midst of all this, you know, bad news travels faster than good news. But in the word gospel means good news. In the knowledge of the good news that God has given to you, can I say this, as a church collectively, sometimes I think you and I should not become preachy. In other words, if you've got your mom and dad or your sons and daughters, I want you to now act out your life in Jesus by action. You see what I'm trying to say? That sometimes action speaks louder than words. And so when it comes to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, and when you are starting to pray, one of the things about earnestness of prayer is the life of holiness. Bible says to me that for you and I have been called to be in holy. And so in the midst of all this, when we start to look at the earnestness of prayer, a man like, like Elijah, a nature of ours, that's the beauty about the scripture. In other words, no one has to be perfect. We, we are fallible. We're going to sin against God. We're going to fall and fall again. And in the midst of all this, such a sinner like I am, God can still use you. So why is Elijah so powerful in the realm of earnestness prayer? If you've got your Bible with you, come with me to the next scripture. The book of, jo the book of, uh, uh, the book of John Chapter 14, verses 12, I mentioned this last night in passing. Bible says to me, most assuredly I say to you, he who believes the works that I do will, will do also. So God is already saying to you, Jesus is already saying, whatever I have done, you are going to do exactly. But the best part of it, there is what we call the formula of multiplication. And the formula multiplication says, and greater works than this he will do because I go to my father. The next part of it, when we start to look at the earnest prayer and a frequent prayer or earnestly or fervent prayer, may I say this right at this moment, I think when we have come to know Jesus Christ, sometimes we can put a lid over God. And in the lid that we put on God, we will try to tell ourselves, I don't think so God could do this, and I don't think so God could do that. Some years ago, Australians are a funny bunch. <laughs> this morning I asked Dr. Seth, you know, why do you guys laugh? And I said, get out, mate. And I said, well, how do you greet? And Dr. Seth said to me, we only just say, get I. Uh, so we add another word called mate. For us, everyone is a mate. And the, you know, if you want to start a business in Australia, you've got to add a mate. Get out of mate. And you've all, you know, you'll straight away get, you know, you know their hearts. Okay, I know because I've been living in the country for 38 years. And plus, I'm married to a skippy, so I know this. <laughs> um, in the whole process of it, you know, as I looked at the scripture, God starts to speak to me and says to me, Aussies have got this love affair of parrots, uh, cats, dogs, uh, guinea pigs, they love animals. They will cry. Or they'll cry more for animals than they'll cry over people. If there's any Aussies, someone says, yeah. Someone knows that, yeah. If there's any Aussies, please do not take any offense. So one day God says to me, you are leaving a congregation where there's, you know, you know animal-loving people. And so God says to me, I want you to start to put a gum tree ad. Yeah, I don't think it's a gum tree in exists over here. You guys have got something else. A gum tree ad, which you will say, a Pedro is actually praying for all animals. And so in other words, a reverend is praying for all animals. Lo and behold, when I started to put ad, people started to come with cats, dogs, parrots, and all of the above. And so when they bring in, they say, the veterinarian has said that this parrot has only got six months. The veterinarian has said this dog has got only eight months. The veterinarian has said that this you know, particular, uh, particular parrot has got eight months. Whatever it is, they will come in. It's like, uh, you know, uh, you know, they will come in their youths and they will ask me, Father Rich, could you please pray? That's a nickname in Perth, Father Rich. 
Would you please pray? In the midst of all this, as I'm praying, the Spirit of God says, I'm healing this parrot. I'm healing this cat. Now give a word of knowledge to this man and to this woman. Right there in the car, the husband, the wife, the children break down, cry, and they give their hearts to Jesus Christ. So what am I trying to say this? Bible says that ye shall do greater works than what I've done. So the book of James, chapter 5, verse 16 says, earnest prayer. You see, sometimes when we make a prayer out of our heart, we mean it, but then do we really mean it in every sense of your spirit man? Most of us, when we pray, we pray from our soulish realm. The soul consists of intellect, will, and emotion. Logically, we are trying to work things out, how God is going to function. But spiritually, though, there's another realm that God is working. How could you tap yourself in the presence of the Almighty God? Now, let me go a little bit deeper. In the book of Corinthians says, the apostle Paul says, I know a man some 14 years ago. A man gets caught up into the third heaven. And that man goes in, he hears inexpressible language. Many theologians, including myself, and times gone by with my professors sat down. We are convinced this is none other than Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul gets caught up into the third heaven and he sees some powerful things like never before. How could a man like Apostle Paul could enter into third heaven and see some inexpressible thing? So from the moment you look at the life of Paul, Paul must have also said prayer earnestly for him to have this invitation at that palace of God, for God to speak to him, for God to entertain what heaven looks like. You see, when we start to talk about earnest prayer, where our spirits are no longer caught out in what I call earthbound prayers, but rather heavenly bound prayers. You see, this heavenly bound prayers has got something tangible in the presence of the Almighty God. Someone asked me, when was the last time you had a wonderful sleep? 38 years, I haven't had much of a sleep. In the middle of the night, he will appear in the middle of the night. He will say such and such a person's name. In the middle of the night, I will do this, I'll do this, I'll do that. Earnest prayer, a life in the, in the midst of every realm of prayer that God has done. One of the powerful things that God taught me, the moment God heals my, all my mental agony and all my mental anguish I go through, and as soon as I come out, the presence of the Almighty God starts to catch hold of me. And I see in your church, Sikara, Rabe, Ture, Rabe, there are speaking of tongues are going through. But Bible says to me, in the book of Romans, chapter, chapter 8, verses 26 and 27, for the things you do not know how to pray, the Spirit of God will egg you on to, spay, to pray in His language. You see, when you start to speak in the realm of prayer, people are always asking you for prayers. It's amazing though, with Aussies, they will, they will not ask anything, but if they are going through pain and agony, if I were to say, can I pray for you? No one has ever said, do not pray. Everyone will say, please pray for me right now. Some more rather, there's a supernatural God over you and he keeps on looking after you. But we human beings have turned against him and we think to ourselves, we have become the masters of our own destiny. But in the midst of all this, this earnest prayer, this, you know, this fervent prayer, pressing into the Spirit of God until He answers us. When I started my early days, I started my ministry at the age of 20. When I started off, by the age of 27, 28 years of age, I was a young man. And God has just baptized me with all the giftings I need to know. And somewhere around about this age, God took me to another country. As I was there, 27 years of age, and about 350 people have gathered in this church. And as I have finished praying, God showed me this wonderful lady sitting on my left-hand side. I asked her to come out in the front, bearing in your mind, I'm only 27, very new in the things of God, just been ordained. This lady comes out, and she stands beside me, and God says to me, I'm telling you earnestly that I'm going to bless her 
and baptize her with one more child, and it will be a wonderful female child I'm going to give. And I just say that right in front of the entire congregation. Everyone is giving a rousing applause. And while they're giving a rousing applause, I see a man standing at the back, and his eyes are going to pop out. His face has become red. Later I realized it was the husband of this lady. And he became very angry and really uptight with me. Lo and behold, I finished the entire service. The pastor was happy and all the above. The man comes. Can I have a word with you, Pastor Rich? He has a word. He takes me. And the church he is having all the, you know, you know, all, you know, you know, you know, cookies and all the above. And the man says, I do not want a child. I said, okay, fair enough. Do you know why I don't want a child? I said, I do not know. He said, I had a, you know, and, he, and he, sh- he says, I had a slip. I had a big slip. Not slip, a big slip. How could I have, a, how could I have another child? So one thing is you can say a slip. Not slip, a big slip. With the scissors like that. I had a big slip. Who do you think you are? I turned around and I could not. I'm 27 years old, bearing in your mind, could not wait to get out of that other place. Number one, I was embarrassed. Number two, I'm ashamed. Number three, I realized I'm still very new to what God is doing right. A slip, a big slip. I said, Sir, I understand your snip and your big snip. And he says, your prophecy, your prophetic word, you and the Holy Spirit does not exist. I, 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 I understand Jesus agrees. I understand the Father agrees. But the Holy Spirit is crazy because I had a big slip. I said, okay, fine. I got into the airplane, never returned back to the country. It took a long time for me to get healed in Jesus' name. And somewhere along the line, three months down the track, this, this man with a big snip, <laughs> he's calling me from London. This is a story in Great Britain in England. I was ministering down there. He calls me up. He somehow or other finds my number. I pick up the phone. This was in 1998 or 1999. I pick up the phone. He says, sir, my name is John, blah, blah, blah. I said, I'm so sorry. I do not know who you are. The man with a big snip, he says to me. <laughs> and I said to myself, my Lord, you know sometimes when you get this, you know, un, you know un, uh, unwanted people over the phone, you, want, you feel like getting an al- aluminum foil and you'll make a noise. <laughs> and so I'm looking for an aluminum foil to try to make a noise. There's a distortion over my phone. There's a distortion over my phone. And it was in me. He said, I know you're trying to hang up on me. Please don't hang the phone. Please don't hang the phone. And I said, God, have mercy on my life. (laughs) He starts to speak to me. And he says to me, Pastor Rich, I owe you a big apology. I said, why? He says to me, my wife is right now currently six months pregnant. So now I feel, you know, I need to give him something back to him. That's the sarcasm of Rich Marais. I said, what happened to the big snip? What happened to the big snip? He said, he says to me, here's the deal. And I went back to the doctors and I challenged my doctors. And I, and I said, didn't you do a great job? My wife is pregnant. I, he said, I did a great job. When they did the MRI and the x-ray, wherever they did the big snip, it grew and it got connected. And out of that, a child has been born. Can we give a round of applause to God and God alone? And, to, and today, that young man is in love with his daughter. You see, I want you to realize in the, in, in the earnestness of prayer, in the fervency of prayer, God wants to imply his will. And the will that he brings in, he knows what's best for you. And so your job is to pray exactly what God says. Don't try to deviate what you think it's best for God to do in your life. You see, in the midst of this, the book of James, chapter 5, verses 17, Elijah is not complaining to God, we need snow, 
or we need tornadoes or anything like that. But rather, God says, I want you to pray, fervently to pray, to bring in, the, uh, to bring in rain. And so when God starts to pray, ask you and imparts you and deposits into you and says, I want you to pray a fervent prayer. And he then also will give you insights what to pray, how to pray, how to touch a man or woman's life. In the midst of all this, don't ever try to become an advisor to my almighty God. You see, he says to me, because I go to my father, he shall do greater works than what I've done. Your job is to go along and do what God has called you to do so. People often ask me, are you a prophet? Are you an apostle? Are you a pastor? Are you an evangelist? Are you an apostle? I said, no. I just plod along. So what's my calling? I'm a plodder. I just plod along what God has called me to do so. I keep on plodding along to see what God wants to do in your life. Greater works than what he has called you in your personal life. Third point, if you've got right at this moment... I want you to come with me, uh, uh, the prayer with God in divine strategies. Prayer with God in divine strategies. Come with me to the book of uh, 1 John, am I right? Yeah. Uh, 1 John chapter 5 verses 14. 1 John chapter 5 verses 14. The Bible says to me over here, now this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, he will hear us. He will hear us. Again, I repeat this. Now, this is a confidence that we have in Him that if we ask anything according to His will, He will hear us. The next part of it I want to impart to you is divine strategies. You see, God will give you some insights. Now, you'll say to me, where is Rach going with this? Now, let's go back, backtrack. God starts to speak to Elijah. Let's leave the book of James. Let's all go through the book of Kings. God then calls Elijah, and he goes up in the mountain. He's, you know, he kneels before God, and he says to his servant, Gehazi, I want you to go and see towards the ocean, is there a cloud rising up? But all of you guys will remember, the cloud never rose up only after sixth or the seventh time. And then when the cloud rises up, Gehazi, the servant, says, O oh, sire, I see a small cloud rising up, but you could see what he was doing in the divine strategy. He was persisting in the realm of the Spirit of God. A fervent prayer and an earnest prayer requires a man, and a, a man or a woman pressing into the realm of the Spirit of God, being persistent until the prayer gets answered. I know a lot of wonderful generals. Someone was sharing to me the other day, Douglas MacArthur, my all-time favorite general, is none other than the American general called General Peyton. Now, Peyton was a cranky old man. He did not have patience. Peyton came to a point that, uh, that uh, to, uh, to, uh, at one stage, he came and checked a bunker. And as he checked a bunker, the wonderful private did not keep his bed properly, and he slapped his face. And he was about to be court-martialed. But I'm not going to focus on that. But let's focus on Peyton. Peyton has been told by the Allied, command, uh, by the, uh, by the Allied countries, we have to take Sicily down from the regime of Hitler, the Nazi regime. As him and his entire, as him and, and his entire battalion are going through to take over Sicily, but on the last number of days, number of weeks, there's been heavy snow and heavy blizzard. This is General Peyton. Remember this? This is just Peyton. Peyton could control the entire armed forces, but could not control the realm of heaven. The realm which now pours snow. He then, he then sends a command. He says, can someone get the chaplain? I need to speak to the chaplain. The chaplain comes in. He says, Peyton says, sir, I want you to draft a prayer and write a prayer so that Jesus will stop this blizzard and the snow so I can take over Sicily. I'll give you one day, draft a solid prayer that heaven can hear my prayers. The chaplain goes in and starts to bow down before God. God starts to give him words. He drafts a letter following day. It was given in the hands of General Peyton. Now, Peyton knows how to use his guns. He knows how to use his rifles. But for one, for one moment of his life, he could not control the heavens, the realm of heavens. 
At this moment, as he starts to walk, he starts to pray and pray and pray over a piece of paper, drafted prayer by his chaplain. Lo and behold, within one day, the snow clears. Within one day, the blizzard goes. Everything goes. He takes over Sicily for the Allied, for the Allied Armed Forces. The general, uh, uh, the general consensus or the moral of the story is this, guys. We are looking at, pray, we are looking at prayer with God's divine strategies. There are moments God will drop something in your heart. Some people will say, Australians will say, my gut says, don't buy this car. Secular people say, you know, my gut instinct says, we change the language. The spirit man says, don't touch this person. The spirit man says, don't talk to this person. Pray for this person. So the other part of it, in earnest prayer, I want you to start to write down in your heart, try to train and train your spirit man to become sensitive to the strategies of the work of the Holy Spirit. If you can start to hear that, God will start to move things off. Earnest prayer, a prayer of fervency, it's one thing. Then entering into the realm of the Holy Spirit and picking up and all the strategies that it can teach us and how the strategies can work in our personal life, it's another thing. If you've got that, then I want you to come with me to the book of Romans, chapter 3, verses 11. Prayer should shape your spirit man. That's where I'm going to go with it. Prayer should, prayer should shape your spirit man. Listen to this. This scripture is not encouraging. Rather, I won't use condemning either, but certainly not encouraging. Listen to this. Verses 11 of chapter 3. Their throat is an open tomb. All right? With their tongues, they have practiced deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips. Listen very carefully. What am I saying? Prayer should shape your spirit, man. But most men and most women who are not in the kingdom of heaven, this is what Paul says, their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues, they have practiced deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips. Proverbs says, life and death is in the power of tongue. So prayer should shape everything in your personal life. I had a wonderful man who comes to church on a regular basis, some seven years ago. Him and his wife often will have loads of tips, sometimes will become in argument. Both are Bible-believing, born-again Christians. Absolutely good. And this marriage was a good marriage, but a marriage which always had some contentions, big contentions. One day, in the midst of a big argument, the husband says to this wife at that kitchen table, true story, in my church, in their own home in the city of Perth, I wish, I just wish you would just die now. That lady, while holding, putting her hands on the cabinet, she fell and the heart stopped working. She died immediately. He's still alive today. And he still breaks down. Still sees me. Still cries with me. And he said, Pastor Rich, I haven't forgiven. It's a true story. I haven't forgiven myself. Out of that three, I just wish you are dead. And the wish came to pass. Can I say this right now? You and I have got power to shape people's life. You and I have got power to shape nation's life. You and I have got power to change and shape the, uh, you know, uh, shape the atmosphere. Last week I was in Houston, Texas, and I was reading in the newspaper. I saw Sue and Patrick Lim, and I, I came to know them briefly. And uh, last week I was uh, 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 in Texas, and I came to know New Zealand is now has come into officially into, uh, into recession. I've been praying for your, you know, for your nation, for your country. I want to say these words from what the Holy Spirit says. Recession does not exist in heaven. Listen very carefully. Recession does not exist in heaven. It exists on earth. So I want to pray that you will come out of this. You are in a good season. In this good season, His people will live in bounty. I want you to start to agree with me. Why do I say this? Listen to me very carefully. In 2008, 2009, 2010, Sue Lim will know this. We went through what we call uh, 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 GFC, Global Financial Crisis. 
out of the subprime uh, sub, uh, 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 mortgage crisis in America affected New Zealand, Australia, Ireland, Scotland, England, all the above. I remember at that moment, BHP, the big Australian, decided to put 350 people out of work, out of redundancy. A young man comes out to me, and his name is Gary. Gary is freaking out because he's the one and only sole breadwinner. He said, Pastor H, and he was earning at about $350,000 a year. He was in a big job. He says, Pastor H, tomorrow morning, they're going to lay me off because of the GFC, Global Financial Crisis. I said, as far as God is concerned, you have got no recession over you. Country will go recession. Our church won't go recession. Those who put their trust in God, they will not go through recession. Following morning, they went down there. 350 guys, 347 guys got dismissed immediately. Three, three guys comes in, three guys, and one of them is Gary. The other two were standing there. And as the boss looks at it, the other two, the two of you guys, you have retained your job. You're not sacked. You're okay. And then Gary is freaking, he's freaking out, and he's really going through a panic stage. What's going to happen? And the boss says, with you, Gary, we have just decided to promote you. Listen carefully. I want you to realize and understand. Don't try to run with the narrative of what the world says. Run the narrative of what heaven says right at this moment. And so when we look at the scripture, the book of Romans chapter 3 verses 11, prayer should shape your, man, your spirit man. A fervency in prayer, an earnestness of prayer, allows a man and a woman over the period of time to train your spirit man to line up with the will of the Almighty God. God will always put His will. It's not that you and I meant to put our will on Him, but let Thy will be done on our personal life. It's the hardest thing because we are what we call, we are control freaks. We want to control everything. Anything and everything we want to dictate and we want to control, including God. But you have to realize, you have to understand, God works in a very different format. He has got a way of doing things. In the last number of years, I've been praying for a number of ladies, actually 12 ladies, right at this moment in, in my church. 12 young women, simultaneously, all are pregnant, all are giving birth to children. In the midst of all this, I just want to let you know right now, Bible says to me, the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, verses 10 to 11, it says, I will make beautiful everything in its time. In the seasons that God brings you in, the biggest thing that you've got to realize, you've got to know how to wait in God, how to prevail and travail in the realm of prayer over and over again until God comes to in your life. A fervency in prayer. An earnestness in prayer. You can't hurry God up, but God knows the best time and the best, best season how you'll answer you guys. Yeah. Then the last point, if you were to come with me, come with me to the book of Mark chapter 11 verses 24. And I want to finish this once and for all. Mark chapter 11 verses 24. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Listen very carefully. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask, when you pray, believe that you receive them, you will have them. The chief cornerstone of this scripture is, people often come in my church and they say they can have anything. I remembered one day I shared this scripture. And a lady comes and she enjoyed the scripture. She said to me, I have found uh, my husband. I said, wonderful, when can I marry you? And, then, and, I, and I, she said, well, that's a problem. I said, what is a problem? This man is still married to someone else. <laughs> so I was wondering, Pastor Rage, would you know when this man will divorce his wife and that I could marry him? I said, how is that uh, the will of God? I said to me, that man is still married. What you're trying to do is actually it's a witchcraft. It's not a will of God, it's witchcraft. And so can I say this? God says you can, you can ask anything and everything. He will give it to you. But on the proviso, though, you've got to realize and understand that it has to be in the divine will of God. And so when we start to look earnestness of prayer, frequency of prayer, and fervency of prayer, could you do this for me? Write it down in your heart, in your spirit, man. 
before the victory comes, start to give God an advance thanks. You see, one of the powerful things that I've found in the Bible through the book of Genesis right up to the book of Revelation, every man and every woman, when you look at particularly David in the book of Psalms, he says, clap for all ye people, clap this, clap that, clap this, clap that. He's always clapping, clapping, clapping. Why is he clapping? One of the powerful things I've found over the 38 years of ministry, the devil is scared of your clapping. The devil is scared of your applauding. The devil is scared of the victory. That's why we as a church, we clap and clap and clap. So when secular people come to the church, they'll ask me, why are you guys clapping too much? We clap because we are telling that the kingdom of darkness, we are on our way to destroy your camp. And as we are going to destroy your camp, we are going to give advanced thanks, advanced victory, and the advanced advancement in the promotion that God is going to give to us our life right now. See, I want you to start to think about the, there should be a paradigm shift. Over the last, you know, 30, 40 years, you know, we are, we've been warned, the devil is coming, the devil is going to take place, the devil is going to do this, the devil is going to do that. Can I say this right now? When the devil comes, the devil needs to run away from you. Not that we should run away from the devil because we carry, God has rede redeemed us and he's poured the blood in us and when he sees us, he has to run 60 miles away from you. But we don't seem to know the power of prayer, the power of earnestness of prayer, the power of fervent prayer. In the midst of all this, you need to realize, you need to know how to clap in the presence of God. You see, it's easy to clap hands while we all are in this room. Have you ever tried clapping for eight hours in the middle of the night all by your own, asking God, you've given me a victory? It is never easy. To do a prayer in solitude, there's no encouragement. There's no people are actually taking care of it. But you and you alone are praying before God. So I say this prayer of advanced thanks. It's amazing, though, the book of James chapter 5, verses 17 says that. But if you start to do some research behind the scenes, Elijah, who was up in the, in a, up in the mountain as he was praying, six times there was, no, there was no signs of a cloud. On the seventh time, there was a cloud rising. What was going on behind the scenes? God, you told me to speak it out. God, I'm speaking it out right now. As I'm speaking, I'm thanking you, I'm thanking you, I'm thanking you, I'm thanking you. That's the power of victory. The prayer of earnestness. The prayer of fervent prayer. And out of the fervent prayer, God then starts to bring a change in a person's life. It's easy, don't take, and please don't take any offense. Sometimes it's a lot easier to perform, to get God, the Holy Spirit, to perform miracles in a third world. Why do I say that? In, in the third world, people can't have access to hospitals. And they have got nothing. And they expect. And their faith is so huge. The biggest problem in Australia is uh, 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 Medicare. We don't pay single bill. We don't pay medicine. We don't pay for ED. We don't pay anything. Everything is free of charge. The taxpayers, it will cover everything in Australia. And so when, you, so when men and women comes up to me, when they, I remembered one lady came up to me and, and she was just walking like this. She came up and she gave me her hands and I'm starting to pray and she says, I want a healing. You know what she did? She says, Pastor Rage, please pray such a way there'll be a partial healing because I want to keep my dole going on. Welcome to Australia. Uh, this was about uh, maybe 13 years ago, 14 years ago. Wonderful lady in her 60s. She's limping. She's limping. She just, she says, please pray for this healing. But please pray when, you, when, when the healing, I don't want the complete healing. Enough healing for me to go back to the doctors over and over again. And then I can claim the dole pension on a regular basis. So the greatest threat in Australia for we can't see healing is to rely on dole payments, pensions, and Medicare. So, yeah, yeah, so you'll see, you know, in, in Australia, it's hard to see a miracle. But when someone is going to go through a place of, you know, your life is on the line, no medication, no nothing at all, then you'll start to see, I want to be completely healed. 
for such a time as this. About three years ago, Pastor Seth knows in my part of the world, I like parking cars. And I, as I was parking the cars with three other gentlemen, a lady with a womb, I have raised four dead bodies in my city. So people will say, dead bodies are hard to raise in the Western world. Yeah, I understand. It's not easy. But I've raised four dead bodies. But the last one was the most spectacular one. When the child in the womb is dead. And then to resurrect the child from, the, you know, from that womb and to resurrect the child to live again. So as I was parking the cars, and I'm parking, this husband and wife comes up to me. And the, and the wife starts to break down and said, why? I, said to her, I said to her, why are you crying? She says to me in, a, you know, in her own language, the child in my womb, eight months old, eight and a half months old, is now clinically dead. There's no activity in the brain and there's no activity in the heart. Everything is gone. And she breaks down. Her mascara was running away. And then the husband is trying to cry, but he's trying to hold his tears. God says, there's another car. Park the car. I said, please stay here. Let me park the car. I come across very, maybe perhaps, uh, you know, Lewis asked me yesterday, are you an extrovert or are you an introvert? I think he worked it out. I said to Lewis yesterday, I'm an introvert. I'm not an extrovert. And then he says to me, then how do you then engage with people? You've got a church. For that moment when I'm at the church, the anointing comes over me. I become extrovert. But the moment I'm, you know, I leave from your presence, I become like a Kim Jong-un. And it goes inside. No one knows where I am, what I am. I become very extrovert. That's who I am. So in the midst of all this, these things are happening right now. I park the cars and I'm doing all this and they're crying. My, so but what does the Bible say? Elijah was a man of our nature. When he started to talk about our nature, that means you're fallible. That means you don't have confidence. That means you're not strong enough. That means you can't do this, you can't do this. There are, write this word, natural human beings will always have limitations. So if I were to go through on the natural, uh, natural human limitations, I will say, and I would have my words to say, there, 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 I'm so sorry, sweetie. Let's now prepare for the funeral. But the natural limitations of who I am is being parked off and out comes and appears a person called the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, appears to me, puts his hands around here like this. He says, the master Jesus says, the child will live on. So your natural human limitations is gone. The supernatural, unlimited God Almighty possesses in you and you say some crazy things in the realm of God. So Bible says, prayer of advanced things. So I turned around. I said, hey, sweetie, I just want to encourage you right at this moment. My master, Jesus, says, the child will live on. She turns around. She says, but Pastor Rich, you're not a medical doctor. You do not know MRI. And you do not know all of the above. I said, I'm not. I'm totally agreeing with you. Go to a clock. They're going to do a C-section. And they're going to pull out this dead, uh, this dead child. But the child will not be dead. It will live. With the tears and all the above, they go and they eventually come Tuesday. They come in and the doctors were expecting, did one more time all the tests. And they said, the child is dead. As they pull the child out of that wonderful womb, the child cries in Jesus' name right now. So, I want to encourage you. Bible is... Bible, the whole word of God, it's full of supernatural. I don't know how men and women can teach the Bible, you know, excluding the supernatural. I don't know how they do it. If the supernatural God was not available today, I would not be standing in front of you. Because the healing that God has done in my personal life, it's been wonderful, it's been powerful. You know, a Tarzan who was once locked up, now this Tarzan is swinging all around the world, disturbing everything that God has given to me right at this moment. That is how I saw. When I dated my wife, one thing, because I was very ashamed of my, of my past, I didn't want to tell my wife that I had autism, Asperger's, OCD. In fact, I came out with this truth only in 2011 or 2010. And uh, I remember one day, we've just been married uh, for two weeks. And we were still in the honeymoon level. 
and I was wearing a shirt, a brand new shirt. Being an OCD person, when someone gives you a shirt, in my case, I, had, I can't wear the shirt because that shirt rubs your skin in the wrong way and you feel doing something. So my entire tradition of Rich Marais, anyone blesses me a brand new shirt, I'll go in the backyard with the shovel, I'll dig the ground one feet down, and then I bury the shirt inside the ground, and then I get a dishwashing liquid and water and put it in and cover the sand. Two weeks later, I dig it out back again just to feel the texture. If it is not good, I'll punish the shirt another two more weeks' time. <laughs> so you could see how disturbed I am because of the OCD I have, or the OCD I used to have. So one day, someone has given me and my wife. Now, a wife has come. I find my wife like an intrusion. I can't do all my secret practices. <laughs> so we were, you know, we were going in the car, and she starts to become you know, very lovey-dovey and just very romantically, and, yeah, like this. It starts to touch me, and I just turn on, stop touching me. I just said, stop touching me. And she just backs off, and she says, have I disturbed you? Have I said something to you? Why did you say that? I opened up, and I just said, sweetie, because you're a shrink, I thought you, will, I thought you would say no. I have got this condition, this condition, this condition, this condition. God has been healing me right now. She did say to me, I did thought there was something unusual about you. I am besotted by my wife, uh, love her to bits and pieces. No one will marry me except this girl called Karen will marry me. And out of that shame, embarrassment, one day God said to me, I've done all these things. You've never told the entire world. Sounds like you're very ashamed of me, what I've done for you. And on that day, the church was in its early days, only 50 people. I went out to the church. I said, guys, there's a secret to my life. I need to say today, from this day onwards. And I went out. I told, guys, this is what I had. And this is what I used to have. I no longer have. I've embarrassed myself. I've been ashamed of your glory and of your presence. Would you, the church, in your heart, will find me to forgive me. From that day onwards, God said to me, wherever you go, you'll always declare my praises in my life. And that's who I am, that's what I am, that's what I do for the presence of God. All eyes are closed, all head is bowed. Father, I thank you. Jesus, I give you praise. Holy Ghost, ask of you right now. In the name of Jesus, God, your blessing is in this entire congregation. I want to make an altar call. And to those of you guys who do not know Savior Jesus, he came and He died for your sins and my sins. We are on a resurrection day. I pray and ask of God, name of Jesus, God. To those of you guys you are, that you are saying, I want to have a breakthrough in my marriage. I want to have a breakthrough in my house. I want to have a breakthrough in my husband's life, in my wife's life. Whatever it is, can I say this right this moment? For me, I had a mental anguish. God heal me. For you, it could be something else in your life. But I want to give you, I want to, I want to give you, an, I want to give you a chance, an opportunity. Give Jesus a go. If it works, stay with him. If it doesn't work, you can actually say, buzz off, I'm leaving you. I told God in 1982, 7th of June, I said, God, if this works, I will serve you for the rest of my life. If it doesn't work, I will leave you. 1982, now in 2024, I'm stuck with God for the rest of my life. If you are here today for the first time, somebody has said, come and check this dark dude. He has got something to say about Jesus Christ. That's the dark. The dark dude is who, none other than me. And I'm just saying to you, don't listen to my words, but listen to what God wants to do in your personal life. If you are that person, you're saying, I'm here for the first time. I want to receive a miracle. I want to receive a breakthrough, but I want to share this with you. There's a small little criteria. And that criteria is you, want, you need to invite Jesus in your heart. Invite Him. I guarantee you the first thing He'll do, the peace of God will come to you. Second thing, He'll intervene in your life. Third thing, there'll be a joy in your heart. Three things He'll guarantee you. After that, you will never leave Jesus.
You'll be with Him for the rest of your life. Is there anyone in this congregation, this loving congregation, who are not conferenced out, but still in love with Jesus? And you are saying, I want Jesus for the first time. If you are that person, would you like to put your left hand or your right hand up in the air and you are saying, hey, Rich, I'm here for the first time. I want Jesus in my heart. Is there anyone at this moment, put your left hand or your right hand up in the air. You're giving your heart to Jesus. Oh, thank you, man. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your hand. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you for one hand, one hand. Thank you, thank you. Is there another, another one, another, another, another two more hands? One hand has gone up. Is there any other person who will say, I want Jesus for the first time? Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, ma'am. Second hand has gone up. Second hand has gone up. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Two hands has gone up. I do not want people to give their hearts in third time, fourth time, fifth time, but I'm asking people to give freshly, first time for the Lord Jesus. You're just visiting this church and you're listening to this crazy preacher this morning. Two hands has gone up. Is another hand which will say, I want Jesus for the first time. Any other person, any other person, any other person. I'm selling the most expensive Ferrari or the most expensive Lamborghini to you. And his name is Jesus Christ. Is there anyone? Is there anyone? If there's none at this moment, all those hands can be put down. Could you say this prayer with me as a, ch- and as a church, as a family? Let's say this prayer together. Father, I thank you for your son Jesus who came and died for my sins. And today I accept you as my Lord and personal Savior. I repent from all my sins. And I now know my name has been written in the book of life. I thank you, Jesus, for redeeming me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can we give a big round of applause to God and God alone? Thank you. God bless. Hey, wow, that was fantastic, eh? And... uh, And um, what we want to do now is we want to just give the um, opportunity for people, if you would like to have prayer, Dr. Reg has said that he is prepared to pray for anyone and everyone. And uh, so what we want to do now is um, we want to just give you that opportunity. If, if, uh, If you would like to have prayer, we'll just get some ushers at the front of each of these rows. And, uh, and we will line up um, two rows across the front. And then when you finish, you can, you can head out. The ushers will refill again as well. So let's just let, uh, stand on our feet where we are. We're just going to thank the Lord for an amazing morning. And then we're going to just open the, we're gonna open the front uh, for, for prayer. And so, Lord God, we want to thank you. We want to thank you that we've all been hearing about persistent prayers that can bring miracles, bring changes. And so, Spirit of God, we ask that you would stir our lives, bring us a deposit in us to be people of prayer, persistent prayer, breakthrough prayer, that we would be able to see mountains move, things shift, Lord, in the lives of people around and about us in this week that's coming and in the weeks to come. And so we ask for a deposit in our life that we walk out of here, people with a nature like Elijah, but able to see mountains shifted because of your promises and your word. And so we thank you for that. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Hey, listen, that's our Sunday. What we want to do is we want to just invite you, if you want prayer, if you can come. And those of you who are in the front row, if you could come as far forward as you you can. So that just gives room for the the second line as well. And, uh, and that'd be great if we could just, uh, just have, say, a couple of lines. And then once this area is full, why don't you just stay in the aisles and then it'll be your turn in the next cycle as well. And so we just encourage the, uh, uh, we encourage the band just to be here as well. If you guys could just play along with us. And so we just welcome your Holy Spirit right now. Why don't you just be, uh, be receiving from the Lord even before you receive prayer? Why don't you just begin to receive from the Lord? Just focus your heart on on that which you know that God wants to do in your life. And so, God, we want to thank you. We want to thank you for that.